Welcome back to HRNHQ for another big grade one weekend. This one mostly on the Eastern Seaboard at Dorosa with Sarah Bodley. Sarah, we're here. Ron Flatter is at Monmouth Park for the $1 million grade one Haskell Invitational. And I think this is a great race. Me too. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention one of our favorite horses, a filly for the ages, <laughs> having won the Haskell in 2009. Legend. Great race. Now she put him away. I've watched it several times, posted the replay. Not really a specific anniversary. It's been 13 years, whatever that means. But when I think Haskell, that's the one that comes to mind. I have been to the race twice. Point given, one in 2001, a uh, great horse in his own right. But just something about watching Rachel's races is really special. Oh, I still watch them all the time. Haskell, Woodward, even the Oaks. Yeah, Freakness, Freakness. of course. Martha Washington. All of them. Just... <laughs> there's, a, there's a great montage on YouTube uh, that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, probably link to that, I guess, since we're on YouTube. But who will get to write their name in the next chapter? You and I actually agree. And even though we're on the same hopeful winner for wagering purposes, uh, we also both agree this is a two-horse race. Right. And everybody should also like and subscribe so yes. that they hear our <laughs> thoughts on future races to come, including uh, the live Saratoga preview next week that I'll be doing with Jeff of Charting Horse Value. But back to the Haskell, the race at hand for this weekend on Saturday. It would be quite the shock if either Tabor or Jack Christopher were not able to get this one done. But there are some other intriguing horses in here. And that's where I wanted to start before we get to the main two heavy okay. hitters. Who do you like for third? <laughs> Uh, for third, I would probably side with White Abario because I do think Cyberknife will be the third choice. So, I mean, maybe a little cagey, for lack of a better word, to be against him. Even Howling Time, I would say I would prefer to Cyberknife if he's the one that takes the most money. And uh, you're going to have to tell me if you have the field written down. Who's number eight? Ben is something. Ben of Vengo? Yeah. If, if he were like completely a bomb on the board and overlooked and everything, I could see spending a few bucks on him being in the try, throwing out the others and just taking a flyer on a straight try type of situation with who we like, which we'll get to. But it's really hard for me. I mean, it's one of those like, well, anyone could be third because I think the top two are so much the best. It's kind of almost a separate race. If you treat it like that, I think White Abario is the best, but no value there. Right. And with White Barrio, I think that's a horse that I really was convinced that his Florida form was quite the specialty being at Gulfstream Park. We've now seen him carry some of that over in the Ohio Derby, where he ran a decent second Fine. to uh, Tony Port. We saw Classic Causeway come back out of that race, switch surfaces <laughs> and just lead them on a merry chase in yeah. our ticket shredding cross country pick five. But White Barrio has answered that Florida form question for me now coming into this race and that's the one that I think could be the likeliest board hitter beneath the top two. Cyberknife is one of those horses I've just never been a big fan of and howling time in the mat win I, I mean did everything but win and some would say he should have won with that photo that went around a uh, very songbird-esque <laughs> result um, with those two finishing so close together at the wire but Howling Time, I wonder if he is more of a Churchill Downs specialist as well, because yeah. he's done his best running there and his two efforts outside of Churchill Downs. You might say it's against better company, but now he's in here against better company. Much better. Uh, third is worth 100000 so decent check if you're able to be third. Uh, but it, it's a scrum among the three we've talked about so far. The other two that we haven't mentioned yet, at the risk of being hype Verbalic. Either one of those winning to me would be the biggest upset in the history of horse racing. Even more so than Rich Strike? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Rich Strike wasn't the least likely winner of the Derby in my mind. Yeah. So. I mean, they should be, uh, and if those who have seen my fair odds before, and we, we can show them now, tip my hand a little bit of who I like <laughs> among the top two. But I usually, you know, think, okay, in any race, some horse. Even a 1% chance is 100 to 1. Half a percent is 200 to 1. I made these two horses 500 and 1,000 to 1. I just don't, I don't see any way they can win this race. I mean, if we're already talking about how one of the top two at least has to show up, then you have White Abario, Cyberknife, 
and howling time to get through. Right. Is there a scenario where the, those five don't run their race? To me, there isn't. Admit. The eight, whose name I've already forgotten. Benavengo. I don't think I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the eight, yeah. that's the one. I mean, even that one I, I have reasonably priced. Like, isn't totally impossible. The other two are. Didn't mean to spend so much time on no hopers, but it. I was just to me that just shows how top heavy it is. But then even after those two, the other three or four, depending on how you look at it aren't bad by any means. Any of them would be favored maybe in a grade two, the West Virginia Derby, a race like that. So I think this is a spectacular field, but it's led by two horses, either of which could end up having to say in the three-year-old male championship later this year. I agree. And at one point, I think we have to remember in the Kentucky Derby wagering very early on, Tabo was the favorite. That's right. And he <laughs> did not run like his odds no. suggested. That was a lot. Yes. Well, we voiced this concern. One of the few things about the Kentucky Derby that we did get right few, yeah. was that we didn't think that he would really be able to compete effectively enough in just the third start of his three-year-old season of any season whatsoever, as he did not race as a two-year-old. And he only beat a couple of horses, eight, in fact, in the Kentucky Derby. One of those that finished directly behind him was Crown Pride. Crown Pride was a horse that was right on top of that pace that completely incinerated in the Derby <laughs> and still finished ahead of White Barrio and Cyberknife. And I know that that Derby can't be the metric by which we measure all of these horses' ability going forward. However, it's kind of not a great sign that a horse that was on top of the pace was still able to hold on over other horses that are now coming back in this race. And now you have all the questions of Taba being in the Yakteen barn for the Derby. Now he's back with Bob. What are we going to get? Uh, I do think he'll be the second choice. I disagree with the morning line. I, I just think between you and I, seems like many others, A, think Jack Christopher will be the favorite. B, would rather bet Jack Christopher. I don't know that he'll be a price worth betting. I don't know if either of the top two will be. It might just be a watch and hope for a great race. Feels funny to say for an undefeated horse in four starts who has literally done nothing wrong and looked amazing this year, moving forward even off a of grade one two-year-old season. But Jack Christopher, to me, is worth betting on the come. He's undefeated. He's untested in some ways. I think Taba is capable of providing that test. Based on what I saw in Belmonte and the Woody Stevens, though, I'm not worried about the mile and an eighth. I'll probably worry a little bit about the mile and a quarter, but... This is his race to lose. Right. I would be concerned if we were going straight to the Travers with horses that we have already seen prove themselves as capable of getting these longer distances, like Epicenter, mm -hmm. Charge It Is Bread to Run All Day, and just blew the doors off in the <laughs> wire, um, early voting, and the rest of the Chad Brown horses. If his test going long was a mile and a quarter as his first route test, I would be more nervous and I would also elevate the competition that he's going to be facing in that race. But this seems like a good spot to find out for him. And he really only to me and you has one horse that he needs to prove himself against right. in here. And let's say we canceled the Derby out of Taba's repertoire in the past. Jack Christopher's Woody Stevens buyer speed figure is a 107. And that's higher than what we saw from Taba when he won his maiden and the Santa Anita Derby. If you're just going on figures, which I don't think anyone ever should only go on those figures, but if you are, Jack Christopher is supposed to win here. Yep, and I think you will. And, you know, not to belabor the point on Taba, because I think grade one winner in a second career start, workout reports, all sterling. Bob's done this before with four late blooming three year olds. So that all fits. But you already talked about the Derby and where his class is, sort of with Crown Pride and the others right around him. Santa Anita Derby was the third choice, which was a tall order, second time start, but the uh, Mandela horse who was in there, no show completely. And then the other Baffert, who I'm drawing a blank on, Messier. who was second, thank you, Messier, no showed in the Derby as well. I liked him a lot. I liked him better than Taba in the Derby. He didn't do much running either and hasn't been seen since. So to me, those are sort of questions that balance with the pedigree question for Jack Christopher. And then your point about the actual numbers we've seen from Jack Christopher tip the scales in his favor. I would bet him, I think my fair odds are seven to five or three to two, I mean, right around that range. I would be happy 
cashing 460 on him. I don't know that we'll get it. It, it just seems like he's going to take more money than Taba. Right. And also on these bigger days, you have the public involved as well, and they're going to see undefeated. They like ones. They sure do. Uh, going into another race that's yeah. happening this weekend. Uh, I-95, and then what's the interstate to Albany? 87? I don't know. Oh, it's been it, a while. Didn't you live on it? No. Oh. I lived in a different part of New York. Yeah, but I figured you took the cross that bridge. You I'm looking over, forward to your bridge picture, by the way. You overestimate a lot about my directional. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we're heading north uh, to a rematch, and very similar to the Haskell, short field for a grade one race, but you get the Oaks winner, and then you get the Oaks runner-up and Belmont Stakes runner-up, a very rare cutback to a mile and eighth for a three-year-old filly. Nest versus Secret Oath, round two. I'm squarely in Nest's corner. Nest is my top pick as well, but I would want to at least bring up the fact that last year in this race, we had a short <laughs> field. We, we had did. the Kentucky Oaks winner, a very heavy favorite. We had some other horses. Trained by Todd, Todd Fletcher. Fletcher. We had some very um, some other horses that people felt as though had a chance to beat her, like Clarier. And then we saw a huge upset <laughs> with Maracuja. That was a big upset. It Not was. as big as one of the two in the Haskell would be. Right. But that was that was an upset. And it becomes so much more of a rider's race when you have such a short field. And now we only have one more horse this year than we did last year. You have two horses that neither of them really have any early speed. Does that concern you at least a little bit as far as how race dynamics are going to play out? I tell you, I was concerned because there was some talk of that even before the race was drawn with, oh, maybe someone can steal it, short field, and, you know, Nest and Secret Oath definitely, they can get into the race, but neither by any means as a front runner. And then I saw the sheets and the two Oaks Phillies are so clearly faster than the rest. I'm willing to say, okay, even if one of these is out alone, preferably Nest, because that's who I'm picking, but Secret Oath is going to run after them as well. And she has that devastating middle move. Now it didn't work in the Arkansas Derby or the Preakness, but she comes with it each time. And it was swoop the group. Yes, yeah, I like that. Swoop the group. And it worked in the Oaks. And she just blew the doors off Nest, who couldn't make up the ground. The shorter field, I think, plays in Nest's favor in this regard. The others just aren't fast enough. I'd love to go back and see the sheets for the coaching club last year to see if, okay, Maracuja wasn't supposedly fast enough either. I think there, though, Malathot, they talked about her maybe for the Belmont. She missed the Mother Goose. There were probably some other things in play there that aren't in play with Nest. This is Pletcher's wheelhouse, getting Phillies especially ready for races like this. I would bet her at anything over even money. All right. Well, the would one. You? Yes. Oh. I, she's my top pick, likely single within the sequence. But Early pick five. Yes. And maybe the middle. Perhaps. <laughs> Society. The horse that is going to be the one that is getting loose on the lead. She's not good enough, but this race sets up very clearly in her favor. And I want to use her at least somewhere to she, Tyler. Yes. I want to use her to split the exacta between I like it. and secret oath. I, because... I would even say you don't even have to worry about who wins. Right. That's your bet. Right. And it, like you single nest, but then say, okay, if this horse can be second, I don't care who the winner is. Exactly. Like if I lose my early wager, I still want to have an exacta that involves society somewhere because she's going to be a huge price. So this is the horse where last time in the notes, it just says loose <laughs> and game. And so that's a horse that I see as those are the tactics that they're going to be using. It'll work out. I mean, she's going to get a perfect trip in her favor to see if she can steal this one. And again, I don't think she is anywhere near as good as the top two, but Maracuja wasn't as good as Mal thought, and she definitely proved that after the fact as well, right. having not performed. Well, look at the Alabama. Right. And et cetera. But I'm looking forward to it, though. I, I think it's great to have, uh, you know, these type of fillies, and there's some others uh, I'm sure we'll hear from in the Alabama and the Cotillion, but uh, we did not zero in on anything at Del Mar, but opening weekend there. Mandatory payout on the pick six at Woodbine. You're going to have an article for that. Really the first of what I anticipate to be many straight weekends. There's a lot going on. Right. I mean, Saratoga, Del Mar, Colonial. Ooh. Horseshoe Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Any breakage at Ellis. 
wild. That's all happening. And you can stay on top of it by liking and subscribing. Yes, you'll never miss another thing. We'll have plenty more content coming out for, er, every week for the rest of the summer. All these great summer races. Uh, Whitney weekend is fast approaching. Very fast. I'll be there. I'll be You're at the going, Hamiltonian. Yep. So you can you know where to find us for yeah, all these great events. Fun. All right. Well, she's Sarah Ahmed. We're both on Jack Christopher and Nest in the grade one races this weekend. Like and subscribe. And good luck.